Session one is entitled Survival and Resistance, the patient growth of the early church. So we're going from 49 AD, okay, about 50 years after Christ, uh, to around 312 AD. Okay, so we're covering about a 300-year gap tonight. This is right after the time that the apostles have died off, okay? Uh, so the apostles have all been martyred except John. Uh, they have, some of them have traveled afar, like uh, Andrew, to India and places like that. And the church is spreading, but it's still very infantile. So we're going to zoom in and see where this takes us. So first of all, before we start, I want to give you a, a main point. Uh, you can jot it down if you want. And I'm going to give you some uh, class goals that you're going to try and learn, hopefully, be able to articulate or understand before the end of the class. You don't have to write all these down if you don't want to. You can snap a picture. Main point, just to summarize this whole session, is despite persecutions from without and divisions from within, Christianity emerges as an unstoppable force in the Roman world. That's basically this whole session in a nutshell. So some, some goals, hopefully, that you understand a little bit more about by the end. First one, to explain the precarious or kind of dangerous legal situation in which Christians found themselves in the first three centuries. So it was, a, it was a dangerous place to be a Christian in the Roman world. Also, we're going to sh kind of show and talk about how Roman persecution worked, what it looked like to be persecuted by the Roman world. We're going to explain this thing called Gnosticism. Keep that in mind. That's coming up. That's important. And the temptation it had for Christians. And then we're going to explain a few terms that are very important for church history. One is apostolic succession, the canon, and the apostles' creed and how they united the church in response to this thing called Gnosticism, this heresy. And then we're going to end uh, by clarifying the importance of the Christian social witness, how Christians live their daily lives in Rome, in caring for the poor, preserving marriage, protecting life, and as part of the long-term cause of Christianity's success. So that's kind of an overview of where we're headed. Now we're going to get on the plane and try and go 300 miles an hour at 3,000 feet. Okay, everybody ready? All right, before we get going, a little intro. Uh, Y'all, if you've read uh, Acts, it's there on your printout. There's a section in Acts that I find beautiful. It's telling the story of how the church is growing. And this comes from Acts 17. It says, they dragged Jason, which is a, um, a Christian man, and some of the brothers before the city authorities shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king. And who's the other king? Jesus. Uh, so that is kind of a good summary of what's taking place. Uh, these Christians literally, in a few hundred years, managed to turn the world upside down and make everything kind of haywire and kind of really mess with the Roman world. So we're going to see how, how that looks and what that really means for turning the world upside down. So let's start with number one, the earliest Christians confronting Rome. We're going to look at how they dealt with confronting Rome. So as, as you should know, I hope you know, Christianity did arise out of Judaism, right? Jesus was a Jew. The apostles were Jew. Uh, and Judaism, an important thing for you to know, it was an approved religion of the Roman Empire. Okay, So the Roman Empire had thousands of deities and many, many different religious cults. And Judaism had found its way because it was a conquered people group. It had found its way into being an accepted religion in the empire. So you could legally be a Jew in Rome. Now, the Jews didn't really cause any stir or any problems. So the Romans didn't care what they believed because they kind of stayed in their little bubble. And the ones that did cause them problems, the zealots, they got a butt whooping in 70 AD, right? Rome came in, killed them all, destroyed Jerusalem, and put an end to that. So Judaism was a legal religion, and Christianity arose out of that. But Christianity was similar to Judaism, but also distinct in several ways. So let's contrast those. Let's look at the similar first. First of all, just like the Jews, the Christians revered the Scriptures. They had this weird obsession with this book thing called the Torah and the Scriptures and the, the writings and, 
and the writings of the apostles, they had this deep reverence for the Holy Scriptures, just like the Jews. And at this point in time, the Scriptures had, a hundred years before, had been translated into Greek. So a lot of Romans had kind of read the Scriptures, the upper intellectual crowd. They had read the Scriptures. They had heard of what those weird Jews believe in all those books. And here comes this new group, the Christians. They also have an obsession with these set of books, the Scriptures. So that's a similarity. Another one. They wouldn't associate with any pagan cults or rituals. So just like the Jews, you're not going to find Christians in the pagan temple whorehouse, okay? Because that's what they were. They were brothels, basically. The way you worshipped was you go and, you know, sleep with a temple prostitute, and that's worshipping the pagan god. And Christians had nothing to do with that, just like the Jews. So that was similar. They wouldn't associate with those things. And then another thing that stood out in the Roman world was they had the same strict moral or sexual ethic that the Jews had. So the Jews were big on a moral code, right? Namely the Ten Commandments. They wouldn't cheat you, or they're not supposed to. They wouldn't steal from you. You know, they weren't violent. You know, the Christians had that same moral ethic, and especially the sexual ethic. Um, Jews were a man and a woman for life, unless things went really bad. Um, And they put a big emphasis on that, the commitment of that union. Well, the Christians come along, they have the same sexual ethic. They're, by by and majority, they're not promiscuous. They don't really have affairs and concubines. They commit to each other in couples, and they stay committed. So those are some similarities. If you were a Roman, you'd go, okay, this seems like Judaism. But here's some distinctions, some things that made them weird, made them different. First of all, The Christians didn't observe the Mosaic law. So Christians didn't have the dietary restrictions that the Jews had. So Christians would eat with pagans. They'd eat meat. They'd eat, you know, pork, whatever. Um, They didn't have the restrictions of the dietary law. They also didn't perform the ceremonial stuff like circumcision and the other rituals, temple uh, sacrifices, the priest system, all that stuff. So that made them odd. Kind of like Jews, but kind of not. Another thing, they sp- this is a big one, they spread their message with fervor. So Jews didn't really proselytize. Uh, some did, but most of them did not. Remember, they, they stayed in tight huddles around their synagogue. They didn't go around proselytizing. Well, Christians were very, very committed to spreading their message, this message about this Jesus guy. So they would talk to pagans, and they were really interested in trying to share that message as much as they can. This was very different than Judaism. They weren't isolationists. Christians lived among the people, worked regular jobs, and tried to get normal people in. And then lastly, they swore allegiance to this figure named Jesus Christ, and they swore allegiance to him alone. So they would not take oaths of office that involved swearing fealty to Caesar. Uh, they did find ways around that where they could, you know, they could serve a centurion and some Christians served in the Roman military. But for the large majority, Christians wouldn't do anything that required them to swear allegiance, undying fealty to Caesar. They only swore allegiance to this Jesus Christ guy. Okay, So that made them weird. And you're going to see here in a second, that made them a little more controversial the Jews were easier to, a little bit easier to deal with. The Christians, not so much. So that is how they started confronting and coming into conflict with Rome. So these distinctions caused them to be seen as a destabilizing force in the empire. Okay? Everybody got that? So because they seem to be outside of this norm, this social structure that all the Romans went along with, They were seen as a problem, okay? They were seen as destabilizing the the status quo, the norm. And because they wouldn't just, well, I want you to just swear swear fealty to Caesar. Just say it. You don't have to mean it. Just say it. They wouldn't do it. And it was a problem. It created issues for them. And we're going to see how that pans out. So a good question to follow that is why? Why was this a problem in Roman society? In other words, if we zapped y'all back in time, why would you have a hard time, if you were a faithful Christian, fitting in with the Roman world? Let's look at a few things. First of all, Rome 
prided itself in the fact that its religious culture was diverse and inclusive. Now, that sounds pretty good, right? Oh, diverse, inclusive? But here's the second part. As long as your religious cult, whatever you worshipped, didn't, that's supposed to say, oh, no, it does, okay, breed sedition or weaken morality. So as long as whatever you believed, you can worship the god of, you know, octopus arms, whatever, you know. You can worship anything you want as long as, and look, you'll be accepted, you won't be treated weird, as long as it doesn't breed sedition, basically cause any problems, and doesn't stir, stir the pot at all in Roman society. And we see examples of this not just in Christianity, like later on when they crushed the Jews, right? They had to put down these different sects that caused any type of issue in the status quo. So that's the first reason. They seem to be very diverse and inclusive. Anybody can have a God. You can believe in any God you want, as long as you don't stir the pot. And then the next thing is their system, this system of inclusivity, it worked most of the time. But here's the problem. It only worked if everyone accepted the status quo and did not challenge the Roman way, okay? Now, if you know anything about Rome, there was a Roman way. There was a Roman culture, right? It was very militaristic. It was very patriotic. They were very big into the emperor. He was basically a god. And as long as you kept all that running, you were fine. You could believe whatever you wanted. But if you stirred any pots or challenged the status quo, you became an obstacle. So Henry Chadwick says this. Um, he's a historian. He said, To refuse to participate in the pagan emperor cult was a political as well as a religious act and could easy, easily be construed as dangerous, as da dangerous disaffection. So, in other words... If everybody worshipped the emperor cult, now, in secret, do you actually have to believe that the emperor is a god? They don't really care. The point is, what happens when a government can tell you what to say? When a government can force you what to say, control what you say with your mouth, then what are they actually conveying? They're conveying that they're in charge, and you follow their rules. So you go burn a bull once a year in the emperor cult. It doesn't matter if you really are obsessed with the dude. What that was showing was a sign of submission to the emperor, to everything that was Rome. Emperor, the emperor was the embodiment of Roman power. So if you went and did a sacrifice to the Roman emperor, it's just like a checkbox once a year. You did your thing. Now you're a good Roman. You put all your stock in the emperor. So... The problem is these Christians were stubborn. They would not do that. They would not say Caesar is Lord. That's what everyone said, Caesar is Lord. You know, it was like a salute, Caesar is Lord, Caesar is Lord. They wouldn't say it. Half of them, you know, a lot of them got killed because of this. They would only say Jesus Christ is Lord. And this caused a problem. So the first signs of trouble... There's many more before this, but remember we're going 30,000 feet. This is in your, in your notes. The first big signs of trouble is this really famous event in AD 64, the burning of Rome. Anybody know who the emperor was? I think it's in front of you. Nero, okay. Nero is emperor at this point, and if you read history, most people think that Nero himself started the fire. Now, most structures back then were a mixture of stone and wood, so it was really easy. They didn't have fire departments like we do, so when a fire got started, it just burned out of control. Well, someone started a fire in Rome. It burned and burned and burned till uh, two-thirds of the city was gone. And remember, Rome's probably the largest city in the world at this point. I think one and a half million people, which is unheard of in the ancient world. A million people, unheard of. So a lot of people died, and most of the city was destroyed. Now... Later on, we found out that Nero is, is suspected to have started the fire himself so he could build an imperial city in his own image. He wanted to redesign Rome. If you know anything about the emperors, they were crazy, right? Crazy with power. So he burns half the city down so he can build some new things the way he wants them built. He wants to give the city a remodel. Well, uh, he when, the, when that finally happened, the city burns down... 
guess what everyone wants to do? They want to point a finger. Who, who did this? So Nero needed a scapegoat. So this interesting quote comes from uh, Tacitus, who is one of our most reliable historians of the era. He says this, To kill the rumors, Nero charged and tortured some people that were hated for their evil practices, the group popularly called Christians. The founder of this sect, Christus, which is Christ in Latin or Greek, something like that, Christus had been put to death by the governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate, when Tiberius was emperor. So Nero's like, hey, there's this weird little cult forming that nobody really likes named Christians. They started the fire. They're seditious. So guess what he did? He had them all hunted down in Rome. He would uh, cover them in animal skins and let wild dogs bore their insides out. Um, he had them dipped in tar and put on poles, and he would light them on fire at night to light up his gardens so that the, the public could come in and watch the wild boars and the wild, wild dogs tear the Christians to pieces. So he was a psycho, a total psychopath. Um, he enjoyed that stuff. That gave him giggles. And so he was literally a, a freak. Uh, he was an antichrist figure. Um, so anyway, he enjoyed that, and he had a scapegoat, and it was all blamed on the Christians. So you can see that everyone let this happen. So you can see how hated Christians really were at the time. Our next glimpse of how bad things started to get is in this letter we have from this guy named Pliny. Anybody? It's like tiny, but not. <laughs> Anybody want to name their child Pliny? I think that's cool. Anyway, Pliny. Uh, Pliny writes a letter to Emperor Trajan. Now, Pliny is a, he's a governor, okay? So he writes this detailed letter that I have printed out if you want to read it. And he's basically asking the emperor for some advice on how to deal with these Christians. And he says, here's what I'm doing. I call them before my court and I say, uh, say Caesar is Lord. If they say no, I say it three more times in order to give them a chance to know what they're doing. Say Caesar's Lord, say Caesar's Lord, say Caesar's Lord. If they say no every time, then I have them executed. And usually it's by the lions or crucifixion. So you get torn to pieces by lions in front of a crowd of people, or you get crucified. And the emperor basically writes back and explains, kind of by way of edict, he's the emperor, so he's in charge. He explains that he's happy with what Pliny is doing. The only thing he wants to tweak is he doesn't think the Christians deserve any type of trial. So they don't get a trial in court even if they're Roman citizens. If they're Christians, they die. It's that simple. They either recant or they die. And he came up with this, this distinction in Latin, religio lacida, which is approved religion. Now that's all the religions that Rome had checked off on. And then this other thing is superstitio, which means superstition. It's a, it's a non-religion. It's a superstition. And that kind of became the lens through which the government... The Roman government looked at Christians. They were in a different legal category. So this was like a law that got passed by the emperor. So if you were found to be a Christian, you lost all what we would call habeas corpus, you know, your right to things. You lost all that if you were a Christian, if you got put in this superstitio category. So they had some major issues with Rome. So let's look at the next sec section. Not only are the Christians dealing with Rome and dealing with this outside oppression and tension, now we're going to look inside the church, okay? They, them poor Christians, you know, it's only by God's grace they made it because they're getting killed and attacked by the outside, but now we're going to see they had some internal squabbles. And anybody here not unfamiliar with Christians having internal squabbles? <laughs> that is a tradition we seem to have not buried. Uh, we still keep that going. But yeah, Christians have internal squab squabbles. Let's see what some of those are. There's this thing called Gnosticism. So the threat of Gnosticism. Now, before you go thinking this is some ancient heresy that we don't deal with, you, you might pick up on some remnants of Gnosticism as we talk about it in the modern era. So what is Gnosticism? I'm going to give you kind of a broad definition. It's in your paper. Uh, and then we'll kind of explain it more. Gnosticism is kind of a generic term used primarily to refer to the theosophical adaptations of Christianity propagated by a dozen or mo more rival sects 
which broke away from the early church between A.D. 80 and 150. So to put that in layman's terms, Gnosticism was not really one coherent system. It was a bunch of little groups of people inside the Christian church who had different interpretations on early Christian doctrine, and they kept trying to divert the church away from true gospel doctrine. And the way that looked is, in its essence, so at the core of it, it taught, and look, we could spend three hours on Gnosticism, so just keep what I, what I tell you, just chew on this. Don't, at, I, we can, you can read a whole book on Gnosticism some other day. At its essence, it was a separation of body and spirit. Okay, to keep that simple, they took Genesis, influenced by a guy named Plato and Aristotle, if you've ever heard of them, Platonic philosophy. They took Genesis and they mythologized it, and they, they constructed this crazy idea, as only humans can, that the problem that happened with sin and evil was when God made bodies for the spirits. Okay, So bodies and physical things are bad, and the real good part of you is the spirit, all right? Now, if any of y'all have read your Bibles, you'll get, there's some whispers of Gnosticism in the New Testament, right? In Corinth, what was going on? Now, at first you're like, well, I can see how they could understand that. Like, the spirit is the eternal part of you, right? Well, what's, what's God going to do at the end of the age? What's Jesus going to do when he returns, New bodies, right? You're not going to be a spirit forever. So a lot of people imagine we can be a little Gnostic, can't we? Where down here we're kind of these stinky, frail bodies, and then we die, and then you're like an angel that floats up to heaven, and you get your wings, and you're going to float on a cloud for eternity. No, that's Gnostic. That's not Christian. Christian is your body, this body, is a seed, like Paul says, right, in the ground, and it's going to resurrect to new life, and you're going to walk around on a new heaven and earth. New dirt, new heaven and earth. Recreation, okay? Well, the Gnostics took advantage of that dualism, spirit versus body. Now, at first, you can say, well, who cares? Like, why, why are they fighting about that? Well, think about it. It had the same problem in Corinth. It was attractive because it provided a way in the Roman world, to be spiritual and a Christian without caring what one does with their physical bodies. Can you see the problem now? So if your body is sinful and dirty and bad and it's going to die and be gone someday, your spirit, now that's the good part, right? Well, what does that mean? You can what? You can do whatever you want to with your body. Who cares? It doesn't really matter. It's going to die someday. We had this same problem in the Corinthian church. Remember that? Paul, what did he find them doing when he came to Corinth? He heard word that they were all doing what? Tell me somebody. I'm trying to wake y'all up. What was, what was going on in the church? Y'all are some fine... Yeah. Yeah, they're all sleeping together. Like uh, sons sleeping with their stepmothers. I mean, people just, you know, affairs, rampant, you know, it didn't matter. And they were still coming to the Lord's table. And what was their, what was their justification? It was Gnosticism. It was, oh, well, the body doesn't really matter what we do. It's just your flesh. The spirit is the eternal, beautiful part of you, right? So this was attractive because let's pretend you're a Roman citizen. You had a, if you were a Gnostic Christian, then you had this cool way that you could be Roman... You could go, I go to the Roman temples, but it doesn't mean anything. I don't mean it in my spirit. I just do it because I have to with my body. You see? And then you could show up to church on Sunday morning. I'm a, I'm a Christian, you know? That was this Gnostic heresy. They tried to explain away this separation between body and spirit. So the early Christians, luckily, and by God's grace, they resisted this heresy. Most noticeably, this guy named Irenaeus of Lyon. Uh, he wrote two major works, The Proofs of, of Apostolic Teaching and this really cool book called Against Heresies. So God raised this brilliant man up and he wrote, he, he explained why this teaching was unbiblical. It did not come from the apostles and it does not come from... And he explained why this was a heresy, why this was a diversion. Not only was this wrong, it was not Christian. It's not the same thing. 
Two totally different religions. Because they wanted to pretend that you could be a Christian or a Gnostic Christian. I'm still a Christian. I'm just a Gnostic Christian. Well, he came along and he wrote and made it clear that no, you're either a Gnostic or a Christian. There are no Gnostic Christians. It's, it's two totally different religions. So they had to really deal with this threat of Gnosticism. So they're dealing with Rome, right? They're trying to kill them, feed them to the dogs and the, and the lions. Now they're dealing with this inside cult called Gnosticism. Let's look at the next section. The need, number three, for unity in faith and order. Unity in faith and order. So let's pretend our church is in that situation. Things are really bad on the outside. The U.S. government is oppressing us, killing us, you know, pulling us in front of a Super Bowl stadium, ripping us to pieces, everybody's laughing. And then inside our church, there's these false teachers in our church trying to teach people, hey, you can be Roman and Christian. It's Gnostic, you know, Gnosticism. So, first of all, I would not be a pastor. I'd be like, I quit. Okay, I'm done. That's too much for me. But that's not what they did, praise God. They had more courage than that. God fortified them. And this is how they mainly dealt with these threats. Few things developed. They defended themselves against this stuff this way. First of all, this thing called apostolic succession. Who's ever heard that term before? Anybody have a Catholic background? Miss Linda's not here. Okay, that's, a, that's still a, anybody, an Anglican background? Anybody? Because we got a Catholic. This is a, still a common term used today in the Catholic and Anglican church, what churches that, that claim this thing, apostolic succession. So what does this mean? All this is, is it was a brilliant way in the early first century, but Irenaeus, he claimed that, he, that the church had enough records that, that they could prove and trace their lineage, each pastor alive, all the elders alive, how Bob was trained by Bobby, who was trained by Danny, who was trained by Joey, who was trained by Paul. Does that make sense? I made up those names, okay? Those are not ancient Roman names. But just in case you didn't know. So that's, that is called apostolic succession. He wanted to show the Gnostics and the secular world that, look, we, were, we are all trained directly by the apostles. So these Gnostic heretics had no training from the apostles. There were no seminaries in that day. So they wanted to show, and, all, and look, remember, we're not far from the apostles being dead. This hasn't been long. So it's not that hard, but they wanted to show succession that I was trained by a man who was trained by a man who was trained by a man that was trained by John or that was trained by Paul or trained by Peter. So it was a way of giving credentials to the early church. There were no seminaries. There were no, nothing like that. So if you could get a little group together, a little Gnostic group that could ordain you, you could say, well, I'm a bishop. I'm a, I'm a pastor, right? Well, the, the real church was trying to say, well, there's a difference in a Christian bishop or pastor and those Gnostic bishops or pastors. We actually are descended from the apostles. And this was a really good tactic because they were able to prove this. They were able to prove that they were trained by somebody who was trained by, trained by the, an apostle. So it was, a, it was a valuable tactic. Now, we're going to run into some issues with this later in church history. But at this point in time, it's a good thing. Second... The canon of Scripture. Now, who many heard that term, the canon of Scripture? Okay. Now, this has been controversial in your lifetime, in recent years, um, because, you know, a lot of liberal Christians and secular society tries to say that the church in this era, about 100 years after the apostles were gone, they just invented the Bible out of nowhere. They just decided this is the Bible, right? Well, that's not what happened. Okay, first of all, so let's, let's read this very, you should have it in front of you, this very important quote uh, by F.F. F. Bruce, the historian. The New Testament books did not become authoritative for the church because they were formally included in a canonical list. All right? On the contrary, the church included them in her canon because she already regarded them as divinely inspired. So does that make sense? What we had to do was, let's pretend we're the church again. There's these Gnostics. They're actually creating fake gospels that back up their Gnosticism. 
They're writing counterfeit gospels and counterfeit letters from apostles. So what's the church have to do in response? They meet together and say, look, we know what we've been studying since the apostles died. It's only been 50 to 100 years. We've been studying all the Old Testament scriptures, and we've been studying these letters written to us by our apostles. That's the New Testament, okay, and the gospels written by the apostles or the close associates of the apostles. So they said, we need to codify this, write this down, and make a formal declaration that this is the only set of holy scriptures we acknowledge. All those Gnostic fakes, we don't acknowledge them. So they've already been studying and using this canon since the apostles died. We have archaeological evidence that 30 years after Jesus died, Christians were quoting parts of the epistles. So these things already existed. So if you find some person on TikTok that tries to tell you that you're an idiot because you're a Christian, well, the canon was invented in 154 AD. You know? It's like, well, no, it wasn't invented then. It was codified then. That's when they said, here's our stamp of approval. Everybody got that? That makes sense? And look, it worked. It was useful. So now, if you bump into a Gnostic friend and they're saying, hey, look at this gospel. It's the gospel of Thomas. Have you read the gospel of Thomas? And you're like, um, no, my bishop says that's not a... I mean, it's good for bed night, bedtime reading if you're bored. You know, you're not going to go to hell if you read it. But it's not really, it's not really from, verified from the apostles. Now, if you want to read the Gospel of John or, or something like that, that's how the canon of Scripture... So it was very useful. It became a way to make it clear what was legitimate Christian documents that came from the apostles and what were fakes. Everybody got that? Good. All right, third and lastly, the Apostles' Creed. Now, what's the problem? The apostolic succession is good. Canon of Scripture is good. But what's the problem with Scripture? If the Scripture is the thing that binds you, which is, it was, what, what were a lot of Christians not able to do? Read. Read. Most people in the ancient, a lot of Christians were slaves or women, so they weren't educated. Uh, and a lot of them were poor, so even poor free men weren't educated. You had to be kind of rich to be educated. So most people couldn't read. So you might have an approved canon of Scripture, but who cares if your people can't read? So how did the bishops and the early church fathers solve this problem? It, they solved it by things called creeds. Now, you've probably heard of this, but creeds are easy-to-memorize, condensed statements that help codify Christian doctrine so that even a little child can learn it, anybody can memorize it, and you can almost sing it like a hymn. Does that make sense? How many of you have ever quoted, anybody raised in a tradition where you quoted the Apostles' Creed every Sunday? Three, four. Four, okay, cool. I was hoping for more, but <laughs> we're going to work on that, okay? We've read it here in, in our uh, liturgy for communion and stuff like that. It's the earliest Christian creed. Okay, and it's pretty straightforward. It, they tried to boil down the simplest definition of Christianity that anybody in the Christian world could memorize and be a test of, do you affirm these things? If you don't, then you're not a Christian. You, you, we love you, but you're, don't, don't call yourself a Christian. So let's look at the Apostles' Creed. This is it. We're going to say it together to wake you up. Okay, So we're about to read the oldest Christian creed. Okay. This is in its original format. It's been tweaked some, not in a bad way. It's just been the sentences were elongated in later history. But this is the earliest form of that, okay? So let's read it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty and in Christ Jesus, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, who under Pontius Pilate was crucified and buried. On the third day rose again from the dead, ascended to heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father, whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, the remission of sins, the resurrection of the flesh, and the life everlasting. It's a pretty good summary, isn't it? I mean, we still believe all those things. I hope you do, if you don't. And isn't it amazing that we just read something written within the first hundred years of Christianity, and y'all still believe these same things? Is that not awesome? 
I mean, name another sect like that. Does anything else exist like that? It changes so much. You know, and look, we do a lot of changing in later church history, but praise God, this has never melted away. This is the original test of orthodoxy. If you don't believe that he was born of the Virgin Mary, then we love you, God bless you, but you're not a Christian, you know? And th this is still preserved for us today, and the early church wrote this and codified this. So that was a good test of the, the illiterate people to be able to discern who was Christian and who was not. And then lastly, number four, the last thing is what they called the unity of order. So what was awesome about Christians were they got organized. Anybody ever heard of like uh, back in the day when the, the, um, the Teamsters, you know, got together back in the, anybody watch movies about the Teamsters? You know, when unions started, what's a union basically? They got organized. You know, they got together, they got organized, and they, fi they figured out how to stand up for one another and fight for something. Well, the first 300 years, Christianity had all this pressure externally and internally, so they got organized. They got to work, and they got organized. And the order of unity was they decided on a, a one, one way that all official Christian churches were going to function. Okay, they were going to be presbyters, which is the same word for elder, that's what we use, or pastor. So there's elders, multiple. There's usually one that kind of seems to be the oldest or the kind of the leader. He was usually called the bishop. All of them were elected by the church. The Roman Catholics changed that later, right? Uh, but in the early church, they were elected by each individual body, okay? And they had the same type of liturgy. So the thing called the lectionary, if you grew up in, in any of those older denominations, you might have heard of that. They read from the same scriptures each week, and they made sure that they did the Lord's Supper and baptism the, the same way. Everybody did it the same way. You have to go through these steps to be baptized, and you, can't be, you cannot be living a licentious lifestyle and come to the Lord's table. So before this, if y'all remember, Paul had an issue with trying to get the church to hold people accountable around the Lord's table, if y'all remember that. Because in the early years of Christianity, it was kind of, you know, hit or miss. Some pastors would take it seriously and fence the table, some wouldn't. Uh, but now they officially decide, look, we're going to draw a line. If you're sleeping with another man's wife in open, unrepentant sin, you're not coming to our table. You're just not. You're not welcome to this table. That's, you can come to our services, but you're not welcome at the table. And that was the way of clearly signifying these are the people identifying as Christians, baptized at the Lord's table, and these are the people not identifying as Christians outside of the fold. So those are the three or four ways that they pushed back against Gnosticism. I think it, I think it was pretty good to be only a few hundred years. I think they did a lot. Y'all agree? There's a lot of work. And you're also, while you're doing all this work, you're dying and getting killed and butchered. Isn't that fun? I think, I don't know what we would do. We'd be in a hot mess. So let's look at number four. Shockingly, if you look at number four, I bet you're going, huh, well, that, that follows persecution. But yes, number four is called expansion and growth. You want to talk about a church growth model? How about we start wrapping people in fur and getting them butchered in the middle of... Uh, the Dowdy Ficklin Stadium, you know, that you think our church would grow then? Come to Emmanuel, get butchered by hogs, you know. I don't think that would work very well. But hey, somehow the Christian movement starts growing. It starts taking off. There was unprecedented growth in the first 300 years of Christianity. By percentage, unprecedented of all time. It was because uh, it started with 12 people, you know, or uh, maybe 80 people, you know. Um, not a lot. And it's just growing and growing and spreading. So, what were the things, apart from obviously God's grace, what was the driving force behind what made Christianity so compelling? So they're getting killed. They're getting burned like torches. They're, they're fight, they got people inside their ranks that say they're wrong. Why are they growing? Why are they growing? What was their church model? They get a cool church sign? They get a logo or a, or a website. 
Did they get some lasers and smoke? Did they get really traditional hymns or really modern songs? What'd they do? Build a new stage, build a new building, ring a, ring a bell, everybody come? No, that's not it at all. Look at the church growth model for the first 300 years. First of all, the witness of Christian charity. I have an amazing little letter, a little excerpt from an ancient letter. This guy, he literally says, he's a pagan, and he's writing about the Christians. And he's, he's, he says, what is with these Christians and the way they love each other? It was strange. Uh, Christian charity was a whole nother thing that had never really existed in the ancient world. These people looked out for one another. Ain't that strange? <laughs> these people loved one another. Look. The rich, a lot of women converted in the early years, and a lot of them were wealthy Roman women. So in Rome, you had a lot of legal protections as a woman if you were a free woman. And, and if you were wealthy, you could spend your money how you wanted. So a lot of the early patrons were wealthy women, uh, like um, Lydia in, in, the, in the New Testament. These wealthy women, they'd just give their money away. They'd open their houses up for uh, widows and for orphans, and they would have them live in their estates out in the country, spend all their money taking care of them. I mean, really. They convert and spend all their money doing this thing. It was the first, believe it or not, it was the advent of what we know as charity. Now, y'all swim in an ocean of charity because we're Americans, but did you know that is a Christian heritage? It's a Christian idea. So ancient pagans were not charitable. That's not how it worked. Charity made no sense. And if you think about it, right now, charity doesn't really make sense today. Okay, let's say you work your whole life, you're Bill Gates, and you become a multi-multi-billionaire. And you've worked hard for all that money. And now you got it, and you're living the life. Why would you give $20 billion away for free? Wait a second. Huh? You know, like, it don't really make much sense, but because our culture says that that's a good thing in the West to be charitable, right, we just take that for granted. That all rich people should be, uh, uh, what's it called, philanthropists. All rich people should be that way. Well, in the ancient world, when you got gold, you kept the gold. When you, when you had houses, you kept the houses. Like, you had to watch out for you. It's the ancient world. People die on the street corner every time. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. And these Christians come along, they convert, and they give their stuff away. They take care of one another. The churches are, are well-funded because people would come and lay all their assets at the bishop's feet. None of y'all have ever done that for me. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's ever converted and sold your, cast out your 401k and said, here you go, Matt. <laughs> no, we can barely get you to tithe, <laughs> much less give all the I'm just kidding. Our church is great with tithing. But I'm saying in general, you think about the modern Christian church, you know. We can't even get people to go to church, much less give their assets away, you know. Open their houses up for a stranger. When's the last time you had a stranger in the church that needed a place to say, just spend the night with you? But me and Connor had my grandfather, who I adore, in our house over the last few weeks because his house flooded. And I love him, and he's great. Don't you go tell people I said this. <laughs> he's great. But it's a slight inconvenience, isn't it, having somebody in your house? You can't watch TV whenever you want to watch TV or walk down the hall whenever you want to walk down the hall, right? But think about the radical charity that these early Christians have. That was the first, the witness of Christian charity. The other thing, the sanctity of marriage. Now, I know you're going, huh, that was attractive? You know, nowadays, half, everybody wants to divorce their spouses. You know, people crack jokes at work. I can't stand my spouse, you know. Uh, no, in this day and age, marriage was a fast and loose thing. So, especially privileged for Roman men. Wealthy Roman men could marry multiple wives. They could have one wife if she was wealthy and kind of well-to-do. You wouldn't want to get another wife because that would make you look bad. But you could have concubines. And you could have as many concubines as you wanted. And guess what? If you had slaves, slaves had no legal rights in the Roman world. So a slave was just like an animal until they're freed. Guess what you were allowed to do? You could do anything you want to with your slave. Child, pedophilia was rampant in the Roman world. Uh, homosexuality, both different ways, 
man and woman, were both rampant in the, in the pagan world. Uh, and then, of course, promiscuity of all natures and sexual deviancies that I can't even tell you. The Roman emperors were disgusting people, like disgusting people. I can't even tell you what I'm thinking of, but they were disgusting sexual perverts. That was the Roman world. Well, then the Christians come along, and this sweet little Christian woman and sweet little Christian man, they get married, they have kids, and they stay together for life. They fight sometimes, but they love each other. They're in a covenant. They committed to one another. The Romans, wait a second, you, you like your wife? You, you hang out with your wife? And you like your husband? You, you hang around your husband? You know, it was strange, but it was attractive. There was something about it that they couldn't put their finger on. The power of a covenant relationship, of that bond, of the mutual respect of man and woman, of the bearing of children, of the raising of households, it was powerful. It was attractive. And lastly, the sanctity of life. Now, you might think that that sounds very modern, like a modern issue, but it's really an ancient issue. Now, you think abortion's bad in America, where the woman goes in, She's given, you know, she's put in a very modern instruments and the baby is quickly taken, okay? Now, that's bad. It's terrible. But this modern American abortion pales in comparison to ancient infanticide. Uh, there are early documents of people literally documenting this one girl that I have written down in there that you can read. I'm trying to remember her name, Mercia or Mercian, something like that. It was a, it was a young Roman woman who converted and when she converted, she would, at nighttime, she would go to the trash heaps outside of the Roman cities. That's just where everybody threw their trash and burned it. She'd go to the trash heaps and she'd listen for infant whining. And she would pick the infants out of the trash heaps and she would take them home. And they said when they, when they interviewed her or asked her why, she said, I just knew that the Virgin Mary had given birth to our Savior in a dirty stable. And I knew if I pulled these little infants out of this dirty pile that somehow God would honor my work. She, she gave herself to, at nighttime, that's how easy it was to hear an infant. Look, there's other documented, they would throw them, there's some drains they have found in Rome, water drains. And in the bottom of the water drain, there's this huge, thick, uh, composition of stuff and it's infant bones where women would just throw the baby down the drain if they didn't want it literally they just pop just chunk the baby in the drain it'll drown down there and it'll be over life wasn't sacred all y'all act shocked but you got to remember these are ancient people life wasn't sacred death was all around them and look if you've already had six girls and you have a seventh you need some boys to work the farm and you're tired of girls so you chunk the girl in the, in the trash heap. Did you know this was the advent of what we call orphanages? Did you know it started in ancient Rome? Guess who started it? Rich female Roman women. They would take their villas out in the country and dedicate it to just orphanages, go, just orphans go to this villa. Well, eventually it became an orphan edge. It's where orphans go. That's the, the advent of orphanages, literally started in this era. Did you know this is where hospitals came from? Bet you didn't know that. There were no hospitals pre this time. Now, you could have a doctor, if you were rich, come to your house. But there's no hospital where you go to if you're sick. There are doctors who are independently employed by wealthy people. Well, the Christians came along and noticed, hey, all these poor people can't afford a doctor to come to their house. And I'm a rich woman, or a Roman woman, or Roman man. I'm going to give some of my money, and I'm going to fund a building where they can, they can come to my house if they're sick. And they can see my doctor. That's where the hospital came from. So all you that work in medical care, it's from the Christian lineage. And so, as you can see, if we're all pagans, and they start doing this stuff, eventually you start going... These people are weird, you know. They give their money away. They love each other in marriage. They have big families. And now they walk around in the trash heaps at night and pick up the dirty little starving infants that we throw out, and they keep them in their houses. 
and now they open their doors for sick people to show up and use their own doctors in their own house? It truly was a moral miracle in the ancient Roman world. And it drew people. It drew people. It was attractive. So that is how the expansion happened uh, in part. So let's look at the last one, number five. The pagan revival and the rise of persecution. Now, I know you're going, rise in persecution? I thought you just said they were persecuted all the time. Well, in the middle of this time period, there's about a 50-year window where things kind of calm down. A lot of people are converting to Christianity. A lot of people are becoming Christians. And it's kind of something the Roman emperors are busy with wars and other things, so they don't want to spend a lot of tax money on killing the Christians. We'll just kind of call it quits. So for about 50 years there, the Christians have a little bit of a peace, okay? So that's around the 3rd century. So around the 3rd century, Rome began to experience decline and military setbacks. Now, Rome's existed for over 1,000 years at this point, and now, for the first time, Rome is starting to lose a few battles. Starting to lose a little bit of territory. Some of the German hordes from up north are kind of taking some and raiding some of the Roman Empire's lands. So Rome is starting to experience military pressure. And it's starting to cut the wall of Roman power is starting to crack just a little bit. Happens around the third century. Well, what, what do you think this did? It sparked a miniature revival of what? Paganism. Now, what's the logic there? Think about it. Why do you think they want to go back to paganism? Nationalism? Very, very much so. So, what else? Who do they think they could blame it on? The Christians. Well, Rome's been mighty for over a thousand years as we served the pagan gods. And then, about, about 300 years ago, these Christians show up, this Jesus dude, and it's starting to spread through our empire. And I see a Christian on every corner nowadays. These Christians have perverted our religious system, and the gods are angry, and that's why Rome is losing. It has nothing to do with the terrible economic policies of the emperors or all the other things. <laughs> it's all because the Christians have done it. So they, they blame them. Emperor Decius, who was a loon, but anyway, Emperor Decius... He claimed that Christianity was weakening the empire, and this is a quote. He believed a return to old religion would make Rome great again. If we'll go back to the old pagan ways, the gods will bless us and we'll be mighty once more. So he offered a sacrifice to the gods in Rome. This hadn't been done in a while. And he ordered everyone to do the same thing. And a certificate was required for proof that one offered the required sacrifice. So Decius, out of nowhere, cracks down on the Christians. All right, no more. You're going to offer a bull to the emperor, and everyone has to have a certificate. Every free citizen has to have a certificate that proves. That it was, they actually had notaries back then, notary publics, and traced their lineage back to ancient Rome. But they had, it had to be notarized and stamped. You had to get a certificate proving that you sacrificed an animal to the emperor. Well, what's the problem with this? At this point in time, there's a lot of Christians in the Roman Empire. A lot. So what happens? This caught Christianity off guard. You see, Christianity had enjoyed over 50 years of relative peace and growth. So what happens in about 50 years? You have a what turnover? A generational turnover. So all the old people that experienced Roman oppression back in the days, they've mostly died off. It's all the younger generations of Christians that really haven't ever dealt with anything scary like the, the old generations had. They're alive at this point, so this causes a problem. Some gave in. A lot of Christians, just or Christians, people that went to church, a lot of Christians... They just went and sacrificed the bull, got the certificate, and just, you know, whatever. Hoped it worked out. Hoped God forgave them. Second thing, some acquired fakes. Now, a lot of sections of the empire, people liked Christians. Christians paid their taxes. Christians were honest. Christians were relatively easy to get along with. So a lot of sections of the empire, they kind of liked us. They liked the Christians. 
So what they did was, look, I know you're a Christian. I know you can't actually burn a bull for the emperor because you don't believe that's real or whatever. How about this? You pay me a little money, and I'll write you the certificate and kind of slide it over to you. That was kind of the trade-off. So some Christians did that. And then some resisted, most resisted, over half, resisted and were tortured and killed under a whole new revival of pagan uh, persecution. So I got a question for you. This is our last slide. What would you do? Think about it. What would you do? What would you do if you had experienced, most of all of you have experienced 50 or more years, okay, of Perfect peace, no oppression whatsoever. What would you do if a pagan emperor passed a decree that everyone must worship me and say I'm Lord and must burn a sacrifice, even if you believe it or not, and get the certificate? Can you hear, can you hear the arguments now? Some would say, no, I would never do that. Some would say, I just did it, I don't care, you know, whatever, God will forgive me. Can't you hear the crowd that said, well, I found a way to get a fake one, you know, so I didn't really do it, but I kind of broke the law, but I kind of did it. it. It would just, what would you do? Just think to yourself, can you imagine being put in a position like that? Or what would you do if you knew when you said no, you were most likely going to die? Out of nowhere, you know? So what this does is this causes a problem for the church, and we're going to see next week how this problem plays out in the next little era of Christian history. So come back next week to find out how this problem grew and how they kind of solved it and what the real issue was. So I hope you've enjoyed that. This is session one, survival and resistance, the patient growth of the early church. So you are called up to uh, 312 AD. Um, I want to read you one quote. It's at the bottom of your page. One of my personal heroes in church history is Polycarp of Smyrna, uh, that's modern-day Turkey. Many of you have probably heard this story, but Polycarp was one of the early bishops who wound up being killed. And you can read the long detail of his experience, but basically the proconsul calls him in his presence and tries, and gets him, tries to get him to recant Jesus. And this is what it says. The proconsul became more insistent and said, Take the oath, and I will release you. Revile Christ. But Polycarp responded... He's an old man at this time. For 86 years, I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? So I hope that Polycarp's dying statements right before he went to the lions uh, inspires you this week. So come back.